It is actually a great honor for me to be here with you. Um, coming back to universities, speaking to leaders of the future, generations in the making, uh, has always been one of the most um, key passion uh, for me personally. And uh, perhaps today, before, before I, I move on to the, the proper uh, deliberation or sharings of thoughts, it is just appropriate for me to begin by taking a solemn moment in expressing a note of condolence uh, to the departures of President George Herbert Walker Bush. Uh, let the record shows that today is the state funeral of a great statesman whom have actually left behind his legacy full of grace. Uh, this is important because uh, President Bush is well liked in China and uh, he has received a very strong positive reactions um, when the unfortunate news of his demise uh, took place a couple of days back ago. Um, two days ago, I was actually in Paris. I was watching the CNN where um, James Baker, the, the previous Secretary of State, was interviewed. And what really caught my attention was when, when Mr. Baker was recalling about what really made President Bush a successful president, and the word that he used was simply because he was a very nice person. Now, those of us who come to business school, some of the informal education that we have gotten along the way is that nice men never, never finish first. You normally finish last. So when you have a great president that left behind such a strong legacy where um, his best friend thought that he would love to be remembered as a nice person, I thought that would be a, a very, very nice way for us to, to begin our, our dialogue today. Now, I haven't got the privilege to meet with 41 in person, but personally, uh, I had the opportunity to, to be with 43, whom incidentally um, shared the very, very same birthday with my son, who is sitting there right now. Uh, he, 43, was actually a very, very nice, sincere person in that sense. Now, both 41 and 43, they have played a very, very interesting role in establishing a solid bilateral relationship with, with China during their respective tenants as the leaders of the free world. And um, if 41 were to visit China today, and I'm sure uh, he would totally be shocked with what he's seeing, how China has transformed herself for the past two decades, given that he was the, the special envoy um, to China back in the 70s. Now, let's get back to why we are gathering today while a state funeral is happening like a couple of miles away from where we are. I guess the reasons why uh, Professor Bob Thomas has invited me today, um, if I may, probably there are two key words that come to my mind. The very first one being China, and the second being technology. Now, despite the fact that um, there is an ongoing trade war happening today, but let me assure you that the world will continue to become a more globalized better integrated and with the currencies of globalizations moving freely, not just in terms of mobilities of human resources, not just in terms of exports and imports of, of goods and services, but more importantly, in the realms of data. Now, that's a um, mega assumption. You know, nowadays it's easy to just come with mega assumptions and then the younger generations like your good self, you are the one that's going to prove me right or wrong as you move forward. Now, the, with that assumption, let me then move on to pose an even larger, uh, brave, bold statement. As I understand that uh, from Professor Thomas today, we have 5% of our participants today that are present and uh, with a direct connection to China. So here's a statement. There is nowhere else on earth today where digital marketing is as diverse, as dynamic, and as daunting as it is in China. 
Now, my sharing today would be structured in such a way that, and I hope by the end of an hour today, uh, you walk away having a better appreciation of how that ecosystem in China has come into the current state. Um, you would be future leaders of the Procter and Gamble's, the Facebooks, the etc. and etc. Um, as you grow larger in your corporate roles, um, you kind of cannot skip China from your, your business plan. So it's important that for you to understand that. Now, uh, we would begin today by giving a bit of perspective of what this digital China is all about, given that one seven of the global's populations um, is now living in a very digital lifestyle. I know that we have um, many students from the United States and also quite a couple from, from uh, other parts of the world, but there's really no uh, where else in, in Mother Earth that uh, people live in such a digital lifestyle compared to China. Now, uh, this fact then would then serve as the, the backdrop, if you like, for us to then explore further the nuts and bolts of what digital marketing is being performed and how it is being accomplished and what sort of trends that are taking place in China. Many years back, when people talk about digital marketing, it's as if that is a subset of marketing. But today, when people talk about marketing without digital elements in it, uh, that is not marketing. Now, and finally, um, I thought our discussion today would not be complete if I and my team we haven't tried to make an attempt to try to talk about um, the issues facing the futures of marketing as a profession. Well, globally speaking today, uh, marketing is in quite a hot position. Uh, it's being attacked everywhere. Some have even gone as bold as predicting the demise of the profession. Well, um, I have different thoughts. I know that there are things that ought to be fixed when things are broken. It's almost that like today, the world that we're living in today, nothing seems to be unbroken in that sense. But when things are broken, uh, it takes a lot of efforts and more importantly, uh, zeal and confidence to ensure that um, this thing that has been existed for, for centuries is given the right opportunities and hope to go back to the path, uh, the right destinies of what it ought to be. Uh, marketing does create values. Uh, I have looked through your syllabus of uh, from chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I think today we are chapter 20. And the reasons why I'm here, because uh, this capstone is supposed to tell you that, look, what you have studied is still relevant. And uh, we probably give you a case studies of how it's really being played out in China. So that's the opening. And uh, I see some of you um, hopefully not falling asleep because I can't see all of you. Uh, <laughs> well, you know, for the fun of it, let's play some video. <laughs> Over the last few years, while traveling the world from country to country, business leaders, entrepreneurs, political leaders, and academics, they often pose the same basic question to me. What is the actual effect on Earth of this digitalization that you are always talking about? Well, the fact of the matter is simply this that the real values of digital transformation lies in its potential that is still hidden if viewed only from a social economic perspective. Its destructive power alters society so profoundly that we are now only witnessing the initial rays signaling a new dawn of enlightenment driven by digitalization and intellectualization, i.e. we are now seeing the birth of the digital civilization. A digital civilization is the logical next iteration of humanity's previous civilization and foundations. The stone stool civilization, the agricultural civilization, and the industrial civilization. It doesn't only exponentially increases productivity, it unleashes individual potentials, and it also brings about efficiency inclusiveness and sustainability to life. Well, it also opens a new chapter in the developments of human society where the impact 
of the fourth industrial revolution would ultimately redefine how the next wave of our civilization would be co-ordered between mankind and machines. As this new civilization spontaneously emerges globally, China has become a best-in-class case study on how digitalization has made a positive impact on practically all of society's social economic layers. China's digital economy has been a key driver of China's economy for the past 20 years. Currently, the digital economy contributes a staggering 32.9% of China's GDP and is growing at the highest rate in the world. Importantly, digital's impact is not industry-specific and not solely economic. It touches all aspects of society and enriches our daily lives. The explosive, deep and broad power of digitalization has led to the transformation of the entire country into what we now call Digital China. Now, Tencent is very privileged to have been involved in the entire process, which in turn has helped knowledge the rapid growth of Tencent. Today, Tencent is shaping and redefining the digital lives of the Chinese people with products in diverse areas ranging from entertainment and social media to the daily use of mobile payments, transportation, dining, healthcare, and even educational applications. Tencent is, as always, a connector. Tencent the Connector has become an integral part of people's digital lifestyles. WeChat alone now has a monthly active user base of more than a billion people. And hence today, Tencent has become the people's brand. And we are profoundly aware that it is those billion users who have lifted us to such great heights. Call it multitasking, virtual reality. How do you like that? Yeah. So I'm glad you, you heard from my twin brothers that's sharing a little bit of the backgrounds of China. And that's it. That's everything about China. We cannot go home now. <laughs> Now, uh, that, this, this really indeed is a key topic every single time when I meet up with head of governments, policy makers for that matter, and of course a fraternity from the academy world. People always talk about uh, uh, China, and in the past when, when China was becoming part of the, the, the members of WTO, people talk about economics, and prior to that people talk about politics. But today the key words in China is literally about digitalization. Now, if I may, if we were to deep dive further, um, there are probably two very important things that we could actually uh, remember, and uh, we should remember about how China became so digitalized throughout their uh, quest of uh, digital evolution. Now, the very, the very key words is called, uh, uh, the milestone, if you like, is, is called mobility, mobile. Now, uh, that has actually spawned the world's largest mobile digital ecosystem, and um, an entire generations of uh, users are being born. Now, I'm going to give you, let you know a secret. Before I came to this room, I was having nice good old coffee with Professor Bob Thomas. So Professor Bob was complaining that while well, you guys are in the classroom, you guys keep watching over your WeChat. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> bad boy. <laughs> so I said, hey, hey, when we created it, we didn't expect this to happen. So don't blame it on us. <laughs> So please, when you do that, at least you say you're not on WeChat. You could say you're on. <laughs> now, ecosystem, <laughs> ecosystem, uh, uh, infrastructures, and etc. Uh, such things will not really uh, uh, become a culture or take a way of life, if you like, if, if the adoptions of such new technology is not being perceived or received by many. Uh, today, the numbers would indeed show that China is the, last, uh, the largest global mobile market. In fact, as of a couple of months back, uh, China has like 788 million um, internet users, and out of which more than 98.5% uh, user actually access the internet via mobile devices. And, and that's the reason why um, uh, companies such as Apple, Companies such as uh, Samsung, um, 
even the Ericsson, Sony, uh, Huawei, etc., are looking at China as one of the most important bread and butter market in the world. Now, with the infrastructure being built, with utility, with uh, time spent, and in fact, uh, the way people people develop their lifestyles day to day, uh, being so well anchored on mobility, you kind of uh, see this is not like a causal effect kind of a thingy, but we observe that the emergence of many new industrial constructs, if you like, um, to be honest, nowhere else, for example, all of us are very familiar with the concepts of e-commerce. Uh, if you were to look at the syllabus of, of MBA students today, e-commerce naturally is becoming a big thing. Compared to a decade ago, e-commerce was just one of the new uh, innovative or incubator ideas that perhaps marketeers ought to try as a new channel to reach out to the consumer. But today, e-commerce seems to be the centers of everything that we're doing. Nowhere else is mobile e-commerce so prosperous, so prevalent and influential compared to what we are seeing in China today. And uh, with, with mobility taking places, the, the emergence of new subsets of new definitions of, 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 of industry that grew out of the, the existing industry. For example, um, digital video streaming, which has actually taken a new life from what entertainment used to be, right? Mm, when we launched uh, Tencent Video um, back in China just, uh, just, just less than 10 years ago, like seven, eight years ago, we started from zero. And today we have 80 million people that was willingly, habitually contributed um, as a loyal subscription user to Tencent Video. So that kind of entertainment values that we have created for our users, and that has largely to do with what we call mobility. And um, things like bike sharing economies. You know, every single time when I come to Washington DC, um, the Four Seasons Hotel has always been my favorite. And I remember the first time when I came around, before I, I, I went over to right here, in fact, so I was just walking across the street, and you see um, the availabilities of some bicycles uh, that are supposed to be shared socially. Uh, but it's actually very difficult to try to you know, find your credit cards in the, in the winter, try to punch in here and there. And then, seriously, you have to like pay like how much? 200 bucks for, for deposit, et cetera, et cetera? No, come to China. You just WeChat it, and then without you realizing it, you are zooming, zooming in Tiananmen Square. <laughs> Honestly, you know what? I write to, I write to my office uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm in Beijing. Uh, I would just get up from my, my uh, hotels or apartments, and I go to the closest um, uh, bicycle, and I just scan the QR code, and then pay it with my WeChat, and then it takes me like 45 minutes to write to my office. Um, Two miles? <laughs> okay. Now, that's not the end of it because uh, some of us here might be more tech savvy than others. You realize that 5G, China will be embracing 5G as sooner as possible compared to many parts of the world. Um, These things about 5G era, which will enable us to expand the horizons of our imaginations. Tell me your imaginations. Tell me what you fancy. We get it for you just like that. Well, for example, some of us here might like to download some videos. Uh, what, uh, what do you call high density videos will probably take you like five minutes to download. Uh, if you stay in a very, very Flintstones era, it probably take you three hours to download. But in the eras of 5Gs, all you need to do is just follow me. Blink your eyes, let's say for five times, your video is delivered. So those are 5Gs, and that, that's actually happening. So uh, China already a mobile nation and will undoubtedly become even more mobile uh, thanks to the impacts of 5Gs. Um, you can actually probably read faster than I do. Um, think about that there's a keyword called VR and AR, Michael, VR and AR, and also the haptic experiences, haptic experiences, you know, touching the way that you, you feel uh, it's, it's really like a more IMAX than you can imagine. And, and this thing is brought to you right in, 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 your, in, in the box of Oculus and etc. So that's mobility when you, look, when you look at China moving forward. Now, the second key milestone when we talk about digitalization in, in China, it has got to do with this thing, what we call Internet Plus. 
what you're seeing next is a chart that shows the progress of, um, of the path to Internet Plus. In fact, the, the, the evolutions of, of, of Internet in China is probably about 20 years. So probably about 20 years. Uh, then in 2015, the Chinese government launched the Internet Plus strategy, which aims to drive further the integrations of the Internet with various uh, industries and therefore upgrading the power of the internet into what is essentially a fundamental infrastructure. Since 2015, the inference has begun to expand from pure economic uh, purposes and to specific industry that actually touches many aspects of the society. Think about internet as the, the, the uh, basic infrastructures like water and electricity. Think about uh, you know, those days, I'm not sure whether you are the, the, the Star Trek generation, unlikely. Anyone have not watched Star Trek before? Please free the room. <laughs> <laughs> See, think about those days. Was it Star Trek or was it something else? Captain Kirk? Right? You realize that Bob Thomas is becoming very much like Captain Kirk's looking? That's actually... <laughs> right. Uh, think about those days, um, the, the, the six million dollar man. You know, my goodness, I'm revealing my age, right? and bionic woman. And what about these things about actually warping somebody from, from physical location A to physical location B? Well, you could actually literally do that because I, I just, um, well, anyway, side story. I was about to go into the Stephen Hopkins of my speech. Uh, but all this is possible with, with quantum physics, with uh, big data, um, uh, zeroing into um, the, the, what do you call the utilities of artificial intelligence. A lot of things are actually possible. Now, um, see, with, with that, that kind of flow of policies coming in, um, following the similar timeline, tech companies such as Alibaba, Tencent, Baidu, Xiaomi, Huawei, and you name it, they then literally have the chance to flourish. You must understand when a country as large as China doesn't become the largest digital economy in the world just out of nowhere. It, it has to come from a very strong commitment of a public policy. 2015, digital economy. 2015, the Internet Plus. And what does it mean by that? It basically means within 20, say, 10 to 12 months, all the provinces are digitalized. There was, there was, there was a directive. There was a concerted agreement on, on, on uh, how we wanted to digitalize the society. Um, in the US, people used to talk about, people used to sing this song, we built this city. We built this city with what? You are so backwards. <laughs> in China, we built this city with one and zeros. So, so that's how digitally things have become, right? And then, then, Following the similar time frames, such companies out of a sudden uh, are receiving a lot of media attention, whether it was from CNN, CNBC, and etc. The reason why they've received a lot of attention largely because they have created a lot of utility. And that utility uh, is not just confined with one type of product categories, but is becoming a huge platform strategy that's providing all sorts of things. Tencent, for example. Um, that uh, during the first video, my, my virtual reality self, as I explained, um, we started way back in 1998. We are 20 years old today. Uh, we have been, uh, we, we are very blessed that we had the opportunity to shape and redefine the digital lives aspects of our online lifestyles of our Chinese uh, people back in China. Uh, that's the result of the deepenings of China's Internet Plus strategy, and that's, that immediate uh, gratification of outcome of that is simply these things about uh, uh, what you call a consumerism being upgraded from a pure consumer Internet into what we call an industrial uh, Internet in China today. This is the main reason why China today is seen as an emerging examples of the digital economy in the world. Um, as, as what Professor Thomas has mentioned just now, uh, a year ago today in Washington, D.C., uh, I, I was given the opportunity to share with the central bankers at uh, IMF, 
not far from here, downtown DC. And um, there were two gentlemen being invited into this big forum uh, where, you know, IMF is, is, is actually the, 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 the clubhouse of all the 180 bankers, central bankers uh, around the world. This guy's main role is to try and figure out how GDP is computed and then trying to figure out standards of finance, uh, economics, policies, and etc. And in that forum, IMF was keen to study how did China arrive at a digital economy status. So I was invited as one of the two key speakers. And my role was to explain to the auditorium, to people, how we came about with, with, with digital economy. And the, the second speaker was a gentleman from the UK where he spoke about uh, cryptocurrencies, blockchains, and etc. Now, if you were to look at this chart, um, it says the digital economy in China is an upgrade due to industrial internet. A lot of people would probably naturally understand, well, maybe a bit of background. Um, when we look at digital components of the GDP, uh, it is further being divided into two very distinct but interrelated components. The first is what we call the ICT portion. ICT meaning information, communications, and technology. And the second is the newly created components, uh, what we call the integrated component. Now, what is amazing from these charts is that more than 77% of the total digital economy has been contributed by the integrated category rather than the conventional ICT uh, portion that all of us are familiar with. And if, if, if I were to use, if I were to find a single word that could actually describe the accents of this chart, I would say empowerment. I would say empowerment. The, the, the value utility created by the first sector empowered the second sector, and then the second sector have therefore grown to be larger, stronger, and uh, with, with a brighter future that, they, that drives um, uh, so-called the, the bigger views of economy uh, utility. And this, to me, is a perfect example of good old Adam Smith's invisible hands of, of the marketplaces taking place. Now, we now find ourselves at a dawning age of what I truly love to call a digital civilization that would be defined and further empowered by this industrial internet uh, processor that we're seeing. Well, how did all these things happen? Largely because it, in China, we have established a very solid framework comprises of cloud computing, uh, payments, artificial intelligence, and digital security, digital technology that in turn will turn industry into something akin to a mega web uh, infrastructure. Industry can then um, engage more in the revamping of basic infrastructures and consequently promoting the country's further transformation into digital China. Now, um, the background of digitalization, the relevance to marketing. In marketing, we have been tracking, and for some time now, in fact, about 10 years, the emergence of digital civilization. Um, that phenomenon has actually led to the changes in users' behavior um, in the industrial environment and the, the society as a whole. Now, as, as a passionate veteran of um, marketing, I, I have been both a pioneer with my teams. We have a lot of people that believe in the pathways of marketing back in China, in Tencent. And we have also been a blessed witness to the digital transformation and marketing changes in China. Now, over the past 10 years, internet companies such as Tencent, we, we had to write our own playbook. I remember when I was in Orlando uh, exactly a month ago when I was participating as a board member of the Global CMO uh, Growth Council. So we had like 2,500 CMOs from the United States all sitting in, in Orlando, all looking for playbooks, playbook of digitalizations, playbooks of artificially intelligent based marketing, playbooks of this and playbooks of that. Well, in China, you don't have a lot of playbooks because when you're literally sitting in that, in that uh, aeroplane that uh, 
you have to fly and mark tree and at the same time considering changing engine at the same time. We kind of like, we, we fly and then we change the engine and then we write playbook with your toes if you like, you know, when, when you fly at that kind of a speed. So that, I, I guess that's how original knowledge is, is being created, curated, created and curated at the same time. Because what you created, when you then curate it together, and then you could actually perhaps sometimes you, you, you throw your original hypothesis out of window. That plane doesn't have a window. <laughs> so what I meant was for the past 10, 15, 10 years to be exact, we, we launched um, the Tencent Mind guiding principles in China in the space of marketing. Tencent Mind, M-I-N-D, uh, 10 years ago, think about China as a wild, wild west. So everybody knew that, oh, goodness me, we must have a ditch the components in our marketing. We must have a ditch the thing. And, and a lot of times, um, you know, today people talk about MarTech, marketing technology. And MarTech, by the end of this year, is going to turn into one billion US dollars industry. Because marketers in the US, marketers around the world are spending so much of their marketing budget into technological related tools and toolkits. Ten years ago, no, we didn't have MarTech. So people in the wild, wild west of China was, were, were, were subsecting, were, were actually uh, allocating their marketing budgets into, into digital. So nobody knew what to do. Tencent, with uh, professors from the US, I remember that time, um, I haven't met Professor Bob Thomas. Instead, we, we invited Philip Kotler. We invited um, uh, a few others, uh, a key prominent uh, uh, advocates of digital marketing in the marketplace. And then we sat together. We tried to figure out how, how do we help marketers to allocate scientifically um, the, the strategic components of their marketing strategies to digital. So we then discussed, we brainstormed, and then we came into this guiding principle, what we call Tencent Mind. And M stands for measurability, I stands for interaction, N stands for navigation, and D stands for uh, differentiation. So it's very simple. For your marketing uh, initiatives that, that uh, involve digital components, if it's not measurable, if it doesn't have an interactivity components in it, if it doesn't navigate to specifically to the types of audience that you're looking for, and if it doesn't build differentiation for your brand accents, don't bother. So those were the guiding principles. Think about it, that was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, uh, 10 years ago, uh, um, Yahoo was still Yahooing themselves, right? <laughs> 10 years ago, iPhone was born, I guess, right? And 10 years ago, uh, people were still using that Motorola phone that goes like that. <laughs> right. So we started that. And, and this photo that you're seeing, every single year, we invite key opinion leaders from around the world to come in and share with us what potentially might be the next key buzzword of marketing. So it came to a point whereby um, every single time, I, I guess the, the, the biggest um, gratification would be when you have a client such as L'Oreal, such as uh, Unilever, uh, such as Procter & Gamble, that their China CMO openly says that, you know, every single year, come November, dry, was it wet or dry, do you still call it here? Uh, rain or shine, you must come to the Tencent Mind Forum because that's where you can kind of, after attending that one full day forum, you kind of know what your marketing strategy ought to be in the following years. So that was the largest kudos that's given to my team. Now, let's move on to the main agenda today. Um, after more than a decade of development, it's very obvious that um, a unique China type of marketing ecosystem has been formed uh, back in China. One that is totally quite different from those in the Western countries. And uh, we, today we have taken the liberty to try to to, to probably just, just, just um, formulate five uh, key characteristics for discussion today. Now you have to remember this. You are sitting in Georgetown University, you're sitting in Washington DC. This is the United States. But when you look at marketing, you have to have a very global mindset. Um, a lot of times we see that policymakers lack the objectivity in, in understanding and in distilling global issues. 
which is why a lot of funny things are happening in the media. And uh, the good things that today we are mourning, so you probably don't see a lot of tweeting. Right? <laughs> now, why this is important? Because if you aspire to be a global marketer, you must have that sense of objectivities. That objectivities have to transcend nationality, have to transcend beliefs, value system, etc. You serve the hidden, the latent needs of that particular audience in a specific country. So this is what we have seen in China, and we love to share with you. Now, first of all, the, the first characteristics of a China market um, marketing ecosystem, what we call um, a tech-driven value innovation. Know this word, MarTech, marketing technology. There aren't many books that have been written about it, uh, but, but uh, a lot of books are not written well enough because uh, sometimes authors don't have the, the, the luxuries of being in the industry to attain um, front-end experience. But understand that the ultimate values marketing really got to do with championing the developments of latent needs of consumers or society at large. Now, in the digitalized landscapes of China, innovation is increasingly driven by a cloud-based technology. Now, that core user value created by internet that I mentioned, internet plus, and the industrial internet comes from the innovations that it drives in current industrial and commercial models. And what do we mean by that? You see, internet plus is not just simply about infrastructure and technology upgrades, but it integrates with digitally driven markets and consumer operations. What is the largest currency of today? It's got nothing to do with oil, you know that. Data is the most important currency of today. Now, um, marketing, if marketing were to rely on the old schools of actually doing research and, and development, you're not using the cloud-based computing to the fullest advantage. Now, in order to truly unleash the potentials of a digital era value innovation, an increasing numbers of Chinese companies have undertaken infrastructure upgrades. And what we see in this chart, that uh, for the past two years, Chinese companies have wholeheartedly embraced the cloud. And um, obviously, internet companies account for the larger growth in the cloud's uh, usage and era. However, what surprises me was that the traditional industry and even government agencies have also accelerated the steps to follow suit. And the, the faster growth of a cloud computing consumption in, in 2017 is actually public sector uh, by traditional um, industries. If you were to visit a city called uh, Yunnan, in the, um, this is west, northern northwest of, uh, of China. Um, when, you, when you go to Yunnan, it's actually a beautiful city. It's a spring city in China. Uh, when nature calls, you take up your, your, your WeChat. You can literally, it will literally guide you to which location where your nearest toilet is and which room in that toilet is available. So this is called precision marketing. <laughs> You know, have you ever often, well, let's see, we have many, many ladies uh, audience today. Think about the, the, the user experience of nature call between men and women. So should we have like five toilets for men, five toilet bowls for men, and five toilet bowls for ladies in a room? Why can't technology help programmatically solve the problems? You know, the five toilets for men, five toilets for women, it could be all together, so depending on who's in the queue, and then the sector should open, right? See, I've just given you a good startup idea. Work on it. <laughs> now, the second uh, defining characteristics of digital marketing in China um, is what we call an always-on consumption culture. Well, in the not-too-distant past, e-commerce was only described as an online behavior and or a uh, like I say, a new sales channel, if you like. But today, more than just a consumer behavior, e-commerce in China has indeed become a lifestyle choice that is deeply rooted in people's daily 
social activities and entertainment uh, selections. I know that we have just gone through the Black Friday. I don't understand why such a happy thing is called Black Friday, but so be it. Yeah. Um, Black Friday, Macy's and all that. Uh, um, a lot of time people think that this, these are some of the so-called seasonal promotional techniques taught by manufacturers or retailers to make sure that the offtakes are being taken care of from, from their retail stores. But in China, shopping is just not about parting with your money. Shopping is a social activity, and that's a beauty of that, and it's only happening in China. Now, for the Chinese market, especially for the young consumers like most of you, only Bob and myself could just stay away and say most of you, right? Um, that always on consumption culture has taken shape um, in the last decade. And of course, when you talk about you needed something to be always on, um, you must require something that's always available. Uh, otherwise, that cannot be always on. Now, enabling this culture, that's where WeChat came in. WeChat mini programs uh, actually helped to bridge the last mile gap in e-commerce. Um, before we talk about mini program, perhaps a, a quick introduction of WeChat. Um, how many of us here don't use WeChat? The door is right there. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, uh, WeChat today, or Weixin as we call it in Chinese, um, China's instant messaging and a social platform, Da, 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 numbers and all that. Um, see, the beauty of that is that what started off as a, a, a potential product, a single app that hopes to connect people on a basic communication purposes, when communication um, is, is being enlarged larger, it has a social element in it, and when this thing is being enlarged further, it becomes a platform, and then you start throwing in ideas such as entertainment, utility, public services, and etc. And then it becomes the largest platform even today for original content. Now, original content for you, uh, for folks in Georgetown, you know that that's, that's actually very important in terms of marketing. Uh, WeChat, as of the second quarters of uh, 2018, more than 20 million official WeChat accounts uh, have been created by individuals and organizations. Uh, that then make WeChat the most popular apps amongst the, the China's, uh, whether it was uh, professionally developed content or, or uh, user-generated content, uh, if you like. Now, specifically, this thing called media programs, uh, infrastructure, which is embedded within WeChat. And mini programs allow individuals or organizations uh, to establish an apps within an app and allowing a faster and easy access uh, to services or commodities. We know that today, marketing is not just about uh, product development. Marketing is not just about brand building, but marketing, more importantly, is about making sure that you keep a long-lasting, trusting relationship with your, your current labs and potential users. So many programs play a huge role, technically speaking, in that sense. Well, it doesn't sound very, very unique and special, isn't it? It is. <laughs> the advantage of mini programs for marketing lie in the ability to really integrate brands into the user's life. I think for those of us who are still fanatics about marketing, you know, marketing, um, sometimes they, they, they kind of um, differentiate marketing and sales, sales and marketing, because probably because when you talk about the connotation of sales, sales always have the idea of trying to push something to people. But marketing is about meeting your needs. That's what I love about the definition of marketing. We care about your welfare. We only provide products and services that meet your needs, and we shall not push some ideas that are totally irrelevant to your current uh, life cycles of your lifestyle. Now, let, let's give you uh, a few examples of with regards to mini programs. For example, uh, mini programs construct a close loop between the mushrooming growth of, of social networks and sales conversion. In China, there's this, this group point uh, like e-commerce mini program called Ping Tuo Tuo uh, that actually achieved a great, tremendous growth and huge fame. How tremendous? What about 300 million daily active users? 
you know, the entire United States became a huge fan of Peking Duo Duo. Uh, uh, and then that IPO totaling, what about 30 billion US dollars in just three years? Think about the, the, the power of social uh, mobility and social marketing. And as people share these mini programs in their WeChat groups in a daily basis. What about mini programs that actually have directly contributed to the transformation uh, between content and business values? Millions of China's internet big Vs, we call it big Vs with a capital V, which is actually VIPs. These are actually the, the social uh, uh, opinions, influencers, if you like, um, social uh, influential micro bloggers. They started to build their very own brand effect in mini programs and among their so-called WeChat fans uh, and having achieved a huge success uh, that you can see from this case and etc. Time is an accent. Um, I would encourage that you, you, you search out for, for such things because um, this thing might not be happening in the US or any parts of outside China, but it will be something, one of the things that is, is, is worth learning about. Well, unlike a lot of uh, well-known brands, um, the, it, it is actually you know, guys like Procter & Gamble and Unilever, their marketing challenges is very different because th they have like 190 years behind them. Procter & Gamble is like that, close to 200 years behind them. But what if you are new, up and coming? How do you ensure that uh, you find the most efficient and effective way to reach out to your potential audience? So WeChat as a platform has actually opened up that uh, possibility where retail uh, is becoming very flat in that sense. And as a result of that, that's why uh, more than 100 millions of brands, 100 millions of brands have joined the mini programs bandwagon within just one year, uh, obviously including some big brands. And in short, mini programs are the testing ground for business innovation. Uh, they connect users and brands, marketing and services, and content with consumption to create an unlimited possibilities. That loop that's uh, becoming a self-fulfilling uh, prophecies. Uh, if, if when you're good, you're good. When you're no good, you'll be forced out uh, within the ecosystem of mini programs. Now, um, the, the third um, trend in Chinese digital market is what we call the blurring, um, the, bl the blurring lines of demarcations between the online and offline worlds, and this has to do with what we call smart retails. This um, brand new retail model, it is a driving force behind the growth of China's retail industry in defiance to an overall retail swoon that's happening globally today. Please know that when I talk about retail, when I talk about smart retail, I'm not simply just talking about combinations of the factors that drove the integrations of online and, and, and offline traffic together. Rather, it is a very comprehensive uh, retail management system which integrates online and offline services, which is driven by data. Uh, if I think, I hope, and I believe that Georgetown does um, make available um, data analysis as one of the key uh, core curriculums if you want to be a good businessman or, or marketer. If you're not familiar with data analytics, uh, you would really be lost in the world that you're about to step in. Now, um, Tencent's a social platform. We have things like um, payment platforms, media platform, uh, and also innovating products that's, that's cloud-based and artificial intelligence capability driven. Many traditional big box stores um, have actually made the transition, such as the, the big names like the French retail giants uh, Carrefour's, a local retail giant called Yonghui Superstores, or even the Swiss, the, the Swiss companies called IKEA. These are all the pioneers in China that they have actually uh, embarked on a new territories of smart retail and um, they are big but they are willing to be nimble and trying out new um, incubator ideas of industrial revolution 4.0 if you like and, and as these whole things are taking shape. 
you know, one of the one of the qualities of a good marketer in the future, you almost really have to be such a good. You know why I, I started by my my presentation today by playing a uh, paying a tribute to President George Bush, being a nice guy. Marketers have to be nice guy. Marketers have to be nice guys because you almost needed the help from everyone in the industry, especially your competitors, to make the pie larger, to work together for innovation, to create, to discover more later needs of the users. You know, sometimes these things about winning a competition, you know, at times certain culture, uh, we, we, we coach our children to be very competitive. When you go to a soccer game, when you go to what you call football, when you go to this and that, you always play to win. But I guess one of the great politicians in the past was talking about you do not win by losing. In the world that you're about to step in, it's more important to play to win together. So being nice would be one way to do that. Now, um, the guys like Carrefour, for that matter, they like dominating the entire radio stores. But then they have to realize that they needed to work with platform companies like Tencent, like Alibaba, they have to work with millions of their users to literally humbly listening to their needs real time, real time, in order for them not to be disrupted. Even they can be that big, you know, because one, one, of, the, one of the great words of wisdom from my founder, Pony Ma, was giants, great giants do die. The difference is when they fall, you can still feel the temperature of the body. It is like just one shot, they fall. I hate to name names, look at some of the great names that we are familiar of the last century. Great companies can just fall just like that, right? If you're not being nice, you're not working closely with your competitors. Now, the examples of Carrefour is worth examining because uh, through our partnerships with Carrefour, um, they have actually, they achieve tremendous results in just under a month. Carrefour signed up 2.5 million new members to their loyalty programs with a member conversion rate of 90%. Tell me which marketing programs would actually bring you 2.5 million just under 30 days and, and with a hit on rates of 90%. Now, what about the... Okay, we, I think we have skipped that chart. There's, there, there are other, other things that's actually happening with similar stories with Carrefour as well in the interest of time. Now, let me move on to the fourth trend in China, which is what we call a societal and sustainable marketing. Increasingly, um, companies in China and around the world, for that matter, uh, have realized that marketing and growth are more and more about creating social values. Uh, businesses, entities, enterprises are to consider their products and services as well as their strategies from two uh, very, very different, and it could actually be be complementary uh, perspectives. First, either are they creating values for customers from a micro perspective, or secondly, if they can do the same uh, for the society on a macro uh, perspective. So in short, there's a strong awareness uh, for enterprises in China to focus more on the greater good, on how they can utilize their capabilities to assist the society in moving towards a better future. I think that's why we see many multinational companies such as uh, Procter & Gamble, Unilever, L'Oreal um, are persistently pressing ahead with environmental protections, preservations, equal rights, and uh, among others, a lot of uh, sustainability strategies. I think this was covered in one of your chapters over the past months as well. And no difference, Chinese companies back in China are doing the same. We might be less sophisticated in crafting the message but I think the intention was the same. Um, what we have been thinking about is how do we go beyond traditional means of fulfilling our responsibilities and instead make use of our most essential strength, uh, focus, and to make social responsibility an integral part of our corporate development. Um, if I may, um, a case study from Tencent for that matter, you realize that the fact that we, when we connect to one billion users, one billion consumers, and largely of our users are actually young people. People think about young people being the future, and um, technology companies always very forward-looking, forward-thinking, uh, but uh, you must not forget your roots, and when you talk about roots, you always refer to heritage, right? So um, 
we then attempt to utilize Tencent's technological power, not just to build a better connections between people, but more importantly, what about between tradition and modernity, between digital and culture, in order to further stimulate um, cultural appreciations and creativity in the society. So this is a case study of what we have done. And um, it all started like two years back when we began cooperations with cultural preservation uh, organizations such as the Forbidden City, um, the, the Tun Huang Academy, uh, which is charged with preservations of the Silk Road, um, the, the China Great War Society, and the very first Emperor's um, uh, Muslim Site Museum. So together, we, we actually explored um, how do we use technology to connect culture. And the result has been a digital cultural uh, preservation solution that even captured the attentions of uh, worldwide um, museums. The, the Great Britain Museum wanted to speak to us. The Louvre wanted to speak to us to see whether we could actually use the similar technology to help them to, to, to create awareness among the younger segment of the society. Now let's watch this video while I have a drink. Two millennia ago, a pearl glistening with art and culture emerged along the Silk Road, the Dueng Huang Morgao Grottoes. I在莫高窟今天已经十一年了 the passage of time is cruel, but beginning in the 1940s, there was a group of people who were devoted to preserving the beauty of Duen Huang through copying painting. I these guardians have been unceasing in their restoration efforts. The struggles of these restorers never ended. Um In 2017, Tencent and Duang Huang Academy of China jointly launched the Digital Silk Road program in order to explore further how to better preserve these priceless cultural relics by using digital technology, animations, games, music, VR, AR, and AI. Modern technologies will shield the ancient culture. Duang Huang culture will flourish again in our hearts and minds. Today, we have one billion people as digital guardians. We all hold a spark of cultural and artistic preservation, which can set the world ablaze.
This is a never-ending battle, and it's an all-out effort for us. Will you be joining us? Well, see, marketing is not just about making money, but very importantly, if you don't care about the culture, the roots and etc., especially the, the, the generations of the consumers, if you have a chance to influence, convince, and touch them emotionally to share the same belief and value system with you, that would make marketing very meaningful in a society, making, making things, making technology for greater good in that sense. Now, uh, finally, we, we, we have arrived at the last um, trend or the last characteristics of what I, what I look at digital marketing in China and what would I call the rise of a new generations of marketeers uh, who represent the futures of marketing potentially. These are young and aspiring uh, individuals whom some are returnees from the West. Very difficult to get a working visa in the US. And, uh, and of course, um, mostly are actually locally bred in that sense. These young leaders realize that meeting the challenges of marketing today with the tools of traditional marketers of the past uh, would, would be incredibly uh, difficult. And on one hand, they have found that um, the space of marketing in the narrower sense, uh, which we currently perceive it, is, is really keeps shrinking. And on the other, by contrast, what defines good marketing keeps expanding in scope. I think that's where hope is all about. Marketing is about service, marketing is about operations, marketing is about products, R&D, delivery, after-sales service, lifetime warranty, and the list goes on and on and on. And only when marketing is evolved and involved in um, every one of those steps that I mentioned uh, will brands and enterprises stand the chance, the test of time, um, the test of time. In fact, nowadays you don't even talk about test of times, you talk about test of tweeters. Um, if you follow some of the latest development in China, one of the Italian uh, luxurious brands in China literally had a big, big um, uh, challenge um, that they literally have to pull out from China because of one one or two simple tweets from people within a company. So here you are, um, these new so-called breeds of future marketers, what are they thinking about? First of all, I think there is a strong realization within these new generations that uh, we have to move beyond the marketing's views to see things from a business views. So what we mean by that, um, the world can keep talking about big data, artificial intelligence and et cetera. But if we were to just look at such technologies um, uh, improvement purely from an insight point of view, then we are just actually um, looking at the same problems. Uh, you know, the old, good old sayings about uh, replacing the borders but not the wine. You know, you can have the biggest toys in the world, but if you keep looking at the same thing, uh, it wouldn't solve the problems. See, the technologies have become such a powerful part of infrastructure um, that they will bring fundamental changes uh, to the way that we do business and create values. And marketers have actually uh, moved, encouraged themselves to move beyond marketing. Um, they wanted to be pioneers and navigators whom um, identify and answer the most significant uh, business questions and thereby helping their organizations um, to take the very first steps towards a more profound, necessary, uh, in fact, if not imperative, transformation of organization. Marketing should not just work within the marketing departments. Marketing has to actually step outside it, within the organizations per se. Now, secondly, we also observe uh, a certain behavior whereby the new generations of marketers are also actively finding ways to prove the economic values of marketing initiatives. Now, this is no brainers because this thing doesn't just pertain to China. In fact, globally, um, people are saying that um, marketers, the top, top officer is the CMOs, um, averagely keep their jobs within 12 to 18 months, and it only gets shorter in that sense. Uh, the reason, one of the key reasons for that is because uh, there is a failure in terms of um, um, empirical um, correlations between growth and marketing activities. 
So I think that's what people are trying to figure out. So therefore, um, it, it's quite pleasing to see that back in China, young marketers are able to present financial numbers. Um, marketers, they, con they are conscious that they needed to communicate and collaborate with others in the organizations laterally um, by speaking the language of economic value creations and consciously identifying and uncover the formulas of profit and loss. And of course, um, they even talk languages about shareholder values creations uh, through applicable cases and practices. Perhaps that, that probably would be one of the way that for marketers to, to gain a more prominent uh, influence at the board levels. Now, uh, finally, this is important. Finally, I think I, I'm, I'm also seeing a huge industry awareness from China, whereby people are forcing ourselves to champion the faithful trustee of the brand legacy. Societies around the world are living in a post-truth era. I really hated this word, post-truth. I was sharing with my son uh, years back. I felt that uh, what is truth, you know, um, be, without being very, very poetic about it, if a leaf were to fall in the forest and no one sees it, did the leaf fall? You know? <laughs> Depends on who tweeted it. Well, the, the greatest danger that we face today is the devolutions of moral values into something relativistic. The, the most influential role of marketing, as we understand it, revolves around building a lasting, strong relationship with, with customers. And in any, any relationship building, trust is the fundamental. And um, in a highly digitalized consumer ecosystem, building trust is really, really challenging. I was, I was like, you know, you guys do, do your WeChat thing while, while Professor Bob Thomas is talking. So I was looking at my books when I was talking up there. And I saw this magazine. It says that leadership is about building bones of trust, quote Colin Powers. We are living in a world whereby trust is becoming a highly deficit asset, and you cannot do marketing if you don't aspire to be the trustee of the brand that you are, you are looking after. Trustee of the brand, not just a brand builder of the brand. Now, brands, therefore, moving forward today in China, we try to take the road less travel. We are eschewing the easy path, and we embrace the higher standards of moral obligations, by acting as the faithful trustees of consumer welfare. Um, don't simply see yourself merely as a great communicator, a great uh, um, you know, content provider, or, or custodians of the brand, that, um, but you really have to strive for that legacy of a brand, uh, brand trustee. Not every company can do that. If you, in the future, work in a company that don't even come close to believing in becoming the, the so-called the, the, the brand legacy custodian of the brand, live and find a job. Look for a company that believes in that, because if you don't, very soon, um, the mistakes of that management is going to be crafted in your tomb grave. You're going to pay for it. Now, uh, in closing, I suppose, so I guess after this, you'll be going back happily preparing for your exams. Do we still have exams? No? My goodness. Well, now, let, let's take a very quick moment to review the five characteristics of a um, digital marketing landscape in China today. Uh, we spoke about technology-driven value innovations. We articulated about what uh, it always owned a consumption um, culture uh, was, was being empowered by always available uh, 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 platforms such as social platforms such as WeChat. And then uh, we also introduced the concepts of the integrated world of smart retail. Remember, um, you know, the world is about smart this, smart that, smart city, smart cars, and smart A, da 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 da. Uh, but when we talk about smart, smart um, uh, retail, we are not simply just talking about the integration between online and offline. Uh, you really have to visit China uh, to buy something from Carrefour, to buy something from Roadside. Um, the, the ease of it is not just about transaction via a mobile phone, but the ease of it is the data that was from transmitting, a data that was actually playing uh, the spiritual role in making sure that the current needs and potential 
future needs of the consumer is going to be fulfilled. And um, I also spoke about, highly spoke about the societal and sustainable marketing um, uh, um, so-called initiatives that I'm glad, I'm very glad to see that's happening back in China. And of course, finally, if I may, uh, uh, I kind of felt that there was an emergence of a new types of uh, future-oriented marketeers where one realized that it shouldn't be very short-term, where one realized that whatever, if marketing were to remain as a strategic component within organizations to create values, we must be the voice of the consumer. And you can only be the voice of the consumer if you are the brand legacy. You are the trustee of the consumers within the board of directors. Well, there you are. Um, what about finishing the thoughts with what's happening around the world? A very quick one. Um, as, as, I, as Professor Bob Thomas has mentioned, uh, I was recently invited as one of the 25 um, board members in this thing called the CMO Growth Council. Uh, the idea was announced in April this year. We met in Cannes for once, and within uh, six, uh, seven, five or six months, actually, we, we provided a common platform uh, for marketing leaders around the world to discuss, to elaborate, debate, and take necessary actions in support of the industry. The, the, the underlying uh, message was that I think marketing uh, professionals say that we must take marketing back. We must make sure that marketing remains as relevant, as strategically uh, 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 significant in, in the role of organizations in the society. And uh, as you are about to move into the real world, um, you realize that this, this thing is actually eroding. Um, look at the books of marketing being written. And I, I would really encourage you to participate in curating new knowledge as your, your, as your experience uh, gather along the way. Now, uh, as I mentioned, after six months of our deliberation, 25 of us, we managed to really cultivate, galvanize a lot of participation from other folks, other CMOs in the world. Um, we had our very first Global CMO Growth Summit in October in Orlando, uh, where five pressing areas were put forward uh, to be deliberated again by 2,500 delegates from the US. Such areas, the initiatives such as the societal and sustainable marketing, uh, customer centricity, uh, brand experience and innovation, data and technology, and talent development and organization. So this chart is actually very, very valuable. So this is the, the, the so-called the brainchild of all the hundreds of years of experiences from marketers around the world. And to, to kind of say that perhaps this is the, the, what do you call it, the playbook? If marketers, if marketing as a profession were to rejuvenate ourselves, so these are the five key pillars that all of us, future leaders such as yourself, we have to work together uh, to make it better. Let me end the session with one video and we'll Well, a long journey today. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I hope that I didn't um, frighten you too much, that you probably changed course after this, right?
Well, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Bob Thomas, and perhaps together we might love to have some questions from you. Okay. Thank you. I know some of you have a class at 2 p.m. and uh, may need to leave, but if uh, any of you would like to ask a few quick questions uh, for Mr. Lau while he's here, uh, please raise your hand and let's see if we can't get a uh, microphone or come to the microphone. Any quick questions? I suspect they have a two o'clock class that they're running to. Okay, sounds good. I've got a five oh, o'clock flight. Here we go. I got a question. Timothy. Um, so the last two days, the New York Times podcast has done something on China and talked about the assumptions that the U.S. had um, regarding uh, the government involvement. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about being a advertising and also social media company and sort of the lack of, you know, the lack of free speech, I guess you could say, uh, given the government. You sounds like somebody from CNN. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they hired me, actually. <laughs> well, um, I actually love to invite you to, to China to take a look at, um, look at a society. Um, when I was in Paris uh, to yesterday, in fact, um, I was representing my company in receiving an award from UNESCO. Um, the award was about um, how our organization has actually contributed to the communities of disabled. Um, UNESCO was championing um, the, 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 the hunger-free project by 2030. UNESCO was championing where as the world was progressing, the, the world was growing, we shouldn't leave no one behind. Um, you know, think about um, U.S. as a very progressed modern society. When you go to any malls, you actually have a parking lot for the disabled. When you go into the, the staircase, the entrance of the mall, you have a space whereby it, it can be utilized for wheelchair, wheelchair accessible. Now, um, this is as much as we have um, arrived in our understandings about the dis disability, disabled people in the society. Think about Stephen Hopkins. The, 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 the largest, the greatest uh, uh, so-called examples of a disabled person with such huge knowledge that was captured within his brain, had it not because of technology, had it not because of some company that actually helped him uh, 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 explain what he has in his mind. Now, that price, United Nations defines disabilities in, in, in a thousand ways. That price, was sponsored and championed by the Sheikh of Kuwait. The Sheikh of Kuwait. I think all of us, the, the reason why I flew to United Nations to receive that award, it wasn't because receiving an award was a fun thing. The reason why I flew to United Nations, it was because I felt that uh, I needed to learn what the world was doing together, what were the, the world was co collaborating together, in making use of technology for greater good. And the reason why I flew into the US to, to, to Paris, stayed one night, received the award, gave a speech, shared with them what we have done in China to the world, and then flew here and to share with you what we have done in China for, for marketing. And after this, I'm flying off to Edinburgh to spend a weekend with my daughter. The reason for that is simply because I think the world needs to get together for, to understand all of us together much better. Think about Middle East. Think about what happened after 9-11. And think about what the Sheikh has done, the Sheikh of Kuwait. His Majesty was there when I received the award. When I look at the, 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 the hundreds of children that was being displayed by UNESCO, people that came like that and trying to sing a song together. When I, when I look at what the initiatives were done in Hong Kong, in Singapore, in Dubai, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, you know, when I went up to, this, to, the, to the podium, I was supposed to, to deliver a speech, a well-written speech by my, 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 my team with, with the Sheikh, so-called His Majesty was there. I didn't follow my script. Immediately I said, you know what? No countries in the world, no companies in the world shall proclaim greatness of their past, shall proclaim greatness visionary of our future unless and until they know how little they have done for the disabled. 
So I'm not answering your question directly. I'm saying that come see China. I think every single society have got their own ways of living together, but um, you all have to really see it for what you know. Right, and I think the question uh, wasn't supposed to be a judgment, but more about operationally speaking, yeah. like whether or not the costs and things like that were different. But oh, everywhere, everywhere. Uh, we, we operate differently in the world. Um, the the so-called the, the, the standard answer to such question is if you operate in the land, you respect the rules and regulations of the land. And in fact, if I would actually dive, uh, digest your question even further, uh, a lot of people look at the, the equity, the share prices of my company that's actually been down by 30%. And, and, and media would have reported it. That's largely due to the, the government's initiative in trying to actually cut down uh, 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 so-called uh, licensing for games and etc. You know, you are MBA students, you know that uh, the equity of a brand will not l easily just be influenced by one unilateral reasons. There are reasons for why stock markets are moving up and down. Um, this is very unfortunate. Facebook is equally, we are equally in a sense, but uh, the, the, my, my, my official and my personal stake is that I've got a lot of stakes in my company equity, and I think we are very hopeful that you will actually return to where you would be. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Any other questions for Mr. Lau while he's here? Hi, Mr. Lau. Thank you for coming to Georgetown University and yeah. uh, giving us such a great lecture. And I want to say it in Mandarin, 感谢您来到乔治城大学. Uh, uh, I'm the one actually who told Professor uh, Thomas that I opened WeChat 80 times per day. Oh, and bad. spend, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and check in the moments of my friends. And I want to say, like, I have, I have two questions of WeChat because I think WeChat is the combination of uh, like uh, Instagram, Facebook, mm -hmm. and even Venmo, PayPal, everything. So uh, does Tencent try to uh, launch WeChat to the global scale? like to promote, push it to mm -hmm. the more foreigners mm -hmm. like this? Um, very, very um, good question. And often the similar question being asked by the BBC and CNN of the world. Um, we, the, the older days of, 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 of so-called internationalizations, when, when, when the companies of, if you're a car manufacturers, if you are a, a packaged goods consumers in that sense, if you, if you sell soda, if you sell uh, potato chips, um, you, you normally think about internationalization. I, I guess um, the, the key business decision from that is, is scalability. And of course, um, uh, the other things is, it, it's probably one of the best way to manage your cost structure, you know, by, by having the same thing and then shipping it out to other parts of the world. And uh, your, I'm not sure whether my finance was correct, your, your, your fixed cost is not impacted, but mar marginal cost will reduce uh, dramatically in that sense. But I guess in the world of internet, um, sometimes we, we were both just talking about it in your office just now. You know, somebody wrote a book, said they just built it, they will come. Don't, <laughs> you, when you build it, it, it need not necessarily mean that they would come. We try to actually launch it. Um, it's the same reasons why um, many, many, some of the uh, respectable um, platform companies in the world uh, uh, doesn't quite get it in other countries. Um, in our line of business, there are such things called adoption rate. There are such things called uh, network effect. Um, WeChat might be great, but the, the, the so-called, um, the, the good thing, the strengths about WeChat so happen it fits very well in the, the uh, cultural behaviors of Chinese audience, right? Um, for, for us to bring WeChat into other parts of the countries, uh, there are many factors to be considered. Whether um, the readiness of the market for an ecosystem to be reborn, right? Uh, whether um, um, within that marketplace, uh, certain key players have already enjoyed the network effect. And, uh, and finally, to be very honest, um, there are still a lot of things that we needed to do back home in China. Uh, when you have like, uh, you know, 700 million over people, so when you start looking at individual markets, uh, there's a lot of cost-benefit analysis that's coming into play. Uh, but having said that, um, I don't profess that, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you were to be there, and I hope you're not going to be there one year from now, uh, asking me the same questions, and two years from now asking me the same question, if I'm giving you the same answers, I shouldn't really be here anymore. Because this answer is relevant as it is today, 
uh, a year down the road or two years down the road, if we still haven't figured out how we want to move out, uh, I think Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Thank you. And I have another question about WeChat, because you talk about the mini programs you built in WeChat and also built a O2O platform, the ecosystem. So I was thinking about, because I rarely see digital advertisements in the friends moments, because I check friends on moments yeah. every time. Yeah. So if there are digital uh, uh, advertisements about maybe promotion information or sales information or other information that will interest me, then I will definitely kick it. And because based on the ac high active user of WeChat, it would be a large number. So. Yeah. So I, I guess um, in, in WeChat advertisement, in moments, um, we, we look at um, one of the comments I made to, to, to CN, one of the, one of the news uh, journalists was that I treat moments as a private property, mm -hmm. properties of, of, in, of, of, of consumers. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you shouldn't bombard people with things that mm -hmm. they don't need. Mm -hmm. So we actually, uh, uh, from a management perspective, we constrain it. Mm -hmm. uh, each user wouldn't get more than two ads exposure in a day. Uh -huh. And we intend to keep it that way. Uh, it is not meant for monetizations, mm -hmm. but it's meant for, for the engine to self-learn, mm -hmm. to make sure that precision marketing does mm -hmm. have a role uh, in, in enhancing the quality of life of our users. Thank you so That's much. That's why, thank, thank you. you so much for your time and for coming all the way from Paris thank and you. going back. Thank you again. Yeah, being back. <laughs>